Okay, so I just wanted to get this video up here to go through some of the features that I've been testing over the last few months with the ZBrush for iPad app. Uh, some really cool things in there. I've seen some good videos out there so far, um, but there actually are a few tricks that I've seen and while we were testing that haven't been showcased. So it'd be really cool to go through those in here. So first of all, right off the bat, you can see that my dynamic wheel is a little bit different. It's got the actual words instead of the icons. So we'll go through and we'll change that first of all, if you want to change it uh, up in the settings in the top right, go down to UI and then in UI, you'll see down the bottom there icon set. So when this is open by default, you would see these icons. Great. If you're into that, that's cool. Um, I actually find that putting them like this is a lot more helpful because it basically is exactly corresponding to what it would be on the desktop app. And I find it a little bit easier when I'm choosing things like masking and selecting. And the other one is input. I like to set the palm rejection radius over a hundred because when I'm using it, my hand gets in the way and kind of stuffs it up. As you can see there, it doesn't move it, which is really cool. So when you're using the pen, sometimes when your hand is on it, it will move the canvas, which obviously you don't want to do. And I found 100 is a pretty good setting for that. The dynamic wheel is basically your point of call as far as navigation in the whole scene. So the same way that the ZBrush uh, desktop app works is Alt and click. If you release, it'll do the in and out. If you hold it, it'll do the sort of pan. There also is the additional, obviously the iPad specific gesture movements, which is fingers, two fingers squeezing, moving left and right, in and out. Uh, if you're orbiting with one finger, you can obviously still do the shift click, which will lock it straight back on. And yeah, alt in and out, same as the desktop. Let's jump straight into masking and selecting. It's exactly the same sort of premise as far as what alt, control and shift do. Uh, so control is masking. You can drag it out, mask it, drag to release. There, tap outside the canvas, we'll invert it drag it, we'll get rid of it. Awesome. Selecting is shift and then into control. We'll give you your regular selection. As you select, you can tap outside to get rid of it. Slide outside to invert it, tap to remove it. Awesome. The really cool thing with the masking and selecting inversing is that you don't even need to move your hands to do multiple buttons, you can actually just slide around, which I think is really cool. So we'll go with the masking first. So we've got the mask there. Awesome. But say I want to cut away at this mask, all you need to do is slide that finger around to alt, and it will cut it out. So you can do the same before it as well. So there, it's just sort of back and forth thing between alt and control just to have mask and inverse mask. It's exactly the same with selecting. So we can go to selection, and then alt will then turn it whether you want selection on or selection off, which is great. And we can just cut away at that, easy. So the next one is the gesturing. So gesturing, I never thought I'd really use it as far as the app, like as far as shortcuts go, but this one, if there's one that you're gonna remember at all, it's probably this because it's pretty helpful and very easy to remember and probably easier than using it the old school way. So first of all, we'll just go to, we'll just get our standard brush and we'll just sculpt some stuff on here. Awesome. So if we want to undo this old school way, bottom left, there's down there, you can see undo, redo, undo, undo, cool, undo, redo. Uh, with the iPad app, it has, it uses gesturing as two and three fingers. So I'll do the two fingers first for undo, 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 undo. Three fingers, redo it. Redo, redo, redo. Whoops, didn't miss the first one there. So that's what it is, undo and redo. It's pretty simple. And I think that it's a lot easier. I, I didn't find myself wanting to be using it, but I actually do uh, think it's a little bit easier than jumping down there. Sometimes I do a bit of both, but it's good to have both options. A uh, cool one that they uh, ported over here as well is the history recall. So our history timeline bar, I actually use it quite a lot in the, in the desktop app. It's just up here in the top right with that little time thing there. You can see there's our time slider. So. History recall is still in here and project history and all the things that uses marked points in the timeline, obviously you can still use it. You can see our little marker there. Cool. We'll set him as a mark. Go back to here, grab our history recall brush, and then we can get rid of that and it will paint back to that point in the timeline. Really cool that they left that functionality in. I thought that might have needed a bit more brains to be able to do that, but super cool that we can still manipulate and utilize the timeline to our advantage. Okay, one of the biggest ones for me, customization uh, in, in ZBrush for iPad. So 
uh, you might have seen earlier I had this toolbar down here so let's just get rid of that and we'll start again so there's two ways to get into the menu for customizing a toolbar you can slide this over and then create a toolbar from here that's great it'll get you to the same spot the way I like to do it because there's the custom menus and toolbars sort of section is up here in the top right next to the question mark is those three squares, which is our customization center, more or less. Let's create a new toolbar. I'll just get do it from here. So say I wanted to grab all of these brushes up here or whatever ones that I have in there. You can just drag one, touch the rest of them with a second hand and then you've got them all there and then drag them down and place them in. So the quick menu, almost identical sort of setup, swipe across, you've got your custom menu there. You can go through all the different cool parts of the, of the menus and just drag in everything that you want. So you can do the same thing with selecting multiple parts, drag them in and you've got them all there. Really cool. So the way that you would get to that custom menu from the home space is space. So over here on our dynamic wheel, so we've got our masking selection sort of section over here, and then space is how we would get to our quick menu. And we can dock this on either side. So when you hit these top arrows up there, it'll shoot to either the left or the right, whether you're left and right-handed, I find that's really cool. So I'm just using my thumb here and then just jump up to my quick menu, easy, really easy there. Um, or if you're right, if you are left-handed and want to have your right hand free, same thing over here, shoot it over to this side, awesome and you can swipe across to your new custom menu. Okay, so I spoke about it earlier at the start of the video about seeing a lot of basic functionality like what I've just gone through there. This one I actually haven't seen anyone talking about, so buckle up. So this one is another customization section which isn't in the center. It's in a completely different area. It's more of a context sensitive part. So say we wanted, to, so it's about creating small little palettes that um, we can adjust and add different things to it as we want to go. So say you go to tool here and say, okay, I want to be able to have my, uh, let's call it, let's go, yeah, we want our tool. The dots above the word tool, if you grab that, oops, if you grab that and slide it off this way, you'll see what happens there. You get this little guy here. Now you've got this little widget. This is basically just a ripped off version of the palettes that are over there and we can customize this to add as many things as, as we want. So we'll go back to here, say we wanna have stroke, we wanna put stroke in there too, grab the top, slide it across, adds it straight in. Couple extra ways we can add to this and get rid of things is holding onto the existing ones and you can add below and then there's this new menu that comes up and then we can select in here, say, okay, I want the texture in there as well and I maybe want my alphas because I'm gonna be doing some alpha stuff. Great, cool. This can just sit docked wherever you want it to be. So you don't have to go digging through all of this. Um, I think this is really, really cool. And if you just want to get rid of it, you can hit delete and we'll get rid of that as well. The sub tools are sitting on their own little icon here, which I think was a really good idea considering people go to their sub tools all the time. But things like this section available to you and the geometry section available to you on its own separate palette, because it's something that I jump to quite a lot being dynamic sub div or any type of modifying topology, it's a really important thing to have quick access to. So I think that was really cool that they introduced that feature. All right, so let's do a, just a quick rundown of the standard interface and what everything's doing. Uh, obviously you've got your top left here, we've got our brushes. So all the different types of brushes that will vary depending on the free and paid version. Strokes, same. Alphas, same as desktop, textures. Materials, this one is good. I will go through this. They actually have partnered down with Monster Clay. Some of these uh, materials are so great to sculpt with. I don't know why they're more satisfying than other materials, but I just find that they are. Um, so that's really cool that they're included with that. And when you send this to the desktop version, they actually send with the materials, which is really, really cool. Uh, so we've got our colors here. When you hold that, it will invert the colors from black and white. This is also a really good spot uh, to remember for when you're filling an object with color. So you can obviously fill that object there, which I've just done. Now it's red, but I'll fill it back. Awesome. So a lot poly paint goes a long way in here because when you're going to be finishing your pieces or doing things just specifically in here, being able to work with the colors is really, really great. So you've got our material, our focal shift, brush size, and Z addition. Uh, a couple of tips with moving around with the focal shift and 
drawer sizes is when I started with this, I would touch there and then touch the slider. What you can actually do is you can just click here and then move up and down from there, which I thought it's just a little tip. All of them work the same way. And it just means you don't have to have make two different thumb movements to make that slider go up and down. Uh, just something there can make your life a bit, bit easier. Then they've obviously got the undo and the redo. Let's jump over to the other side. Uh, BPR render uh, for when you can be bothered to set that up correctly and it doesn't look like that. Um, that's There's obviously a time and a place for the BPRs. Perspective on and off, floor on and off, symmetry on and off, dynamic symmetry, local symmetry on and off, framing the mesh, which can be very helpful when you get stuck, when you're you know in like this, you need to frame, it's really cool. Uh, polyframe, ghost mode, uh, whatever it's called, transparency and ghost. Um, and this one is actually really good to use, this last one down here, this the solo, the dynamic solo as far as, so we'll just duplicate a couple of these. The good thing about dynamic solo is if you hold on to solo, you can go to dynamic. So what this does is if you have multiple subtools in your scene, when you rotate, it'll turn things off. This is a saver, like a energy saver, brain saver, memory saver, when it comes to navigating in the viewport, if you have multiple subtools, can get a bit annoying, but I think that it is a really cool feature if you do have a lot of information in there, is to be able to have that feature to turn that on and off is really great. So we've been through the brushes down the bottom. Um, as you saw me move before, this guy down this guy down here is the gizmo guy that we usually use. And then for the real hardcores, there's the transpose line in there as well. Dynamesh, hold down for our Dynamesh settings. Awesome. Sculptures Pro for when you're using Sculptures. Zero Mesher, everyone loves a bit of Zero Mesher. And they all work exactly the same. So setting poly counts, double half, detect edges, really good stuff, subdivide which is also a go-to. So I like the way that they've arranged this is really good because it's sort of like workflow based. Like you want to be working with Dynamesh, then you want to zero mesh, then you want to add divisions. I kind of like that it's that left to right as well. And then Booleans on the end there if you want to be using Booleans. So just a, just a little bit of a shout out to the difference of this brush here, the paintbrush. It works really well with this color having this set. So you can see when I've got that paintbrush selected, the colors don't change actually on my meshes because it's like it's setting to this color. So if I go RGB, there's our color there. If we wanted to sculpt with color as well, it would be the same way that it works on the desktop app where you would use a standard RGB, Z add, and then it's got a bit of both. So we can increase that, awesome. Double tap, get rid of all that. Adding brushes to the favorites is pretty cool. You can just hold down and it just goes add to favorites and you can add it there. I'll add that to there. And you can see in your favorite section, get a little selection there. That's kind of another level of customization, which is pretty helpful. Okay, so last couple of, last couple of big ones here is the import and export. So I've actually got ZBrush 2025 sitting here next to me. If I'm exporting, if I'm working on this and this is amazing, let's open Okay, so say I wanted to export this to ZBrush, my desktop version. So what they've incorporated into ZBrush 2025 and the iPad is a pretty seamless back and forth between the two of them, which is really, really great. It actually transfers everything. So even the document background settings, all the different, like the material that's set on the model as well is really, really cool. So it's um, just up here, you can see in the top left, you've got the import and the export buttons. So we can go to export. And what it does is if you're on the same network as your desktop, then it will come up with your PC. As you can see there, there's my PC and I'll hit send to PC. And as you can see there, iPad wants to send you your file. Awesome. So we won't save that because secretly it's the exact same file. Boom, there you go, look at that. So that is the exact same file from the iPad version. Say we make a bunch of changes to this. We're really happy with it and we want to send this back to the iPad. Over here in the toolbar, you can see this new GoZ to iPad. So it's the same sort of system back and forth. So I'll just hit go to iPad. You have to go to GoZ over on your iPad and set it up for that import section. And you will see, boom, there's our iPad. There's me. Click that, send. And you'll see on the iPad, boom, received.
and there it is. Importing is the exact same thing. It's just straight up into here and then 3D model if you have it exported from somewhere else. So that's pretty much it. Uh, this is from the last couple of months, you know, having working with this thing and seeing all the different iterations of what the iPad ZBrush for iPad has gone through. It's really cool to see where it's gotten to and the future looks really, really cool for, for what they want to be doing with it and all the different things. It looks like they, you know, want to be able to tackle almost everything that's on the desktop version inside the iPad. So a couple of things that I would be really excited to see, Z Modeler is a huge part of my workflow. I actually think that could be an app in itself, how good Z Modeler is and how deep it is. Um, so I'd love to see Z Modeler in there. Um, and also reference material. So having a reference, a piece of reference material in here the same way that you would in the desktop app, I think would be very helpful. Uh, so those will be the two biggest things for me that I'd be wanting coming releases of ZBrush for iPad. Uh, let me know in the comments what you guys want because uh, I'm still in the beta testing for the, for the team and would love to keep forwarding on a lot of my my feedback to it and what we what we want to be seeing and how you want to be seeing it incorporated would be really cool so yeah let me know in the comments hit me up on discord thanks so much for all the support as always um and i'll see you in the next one thanks